Good evening, everyone, and it's a pleasure to invite you all to this uh, webinar uh, seminar with some eminent personalities. Uh, my name is Shantanu Paul. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Talent Sprint. Um, along with me today uh, for this uh, very interesting topic that we are going to have a discussion on, uh, we have uh, Dr. Tithankar uh, from uh, National Stock Exchange, who is the chief economist. Dr. Tithankar Patnaik, uh, please raise your hand so that people can recognize you. Um, and we have uh, we have Dr. P uh, Professor Partho Ray, who is from IIM Calcutta, who teaches uh, microeconomics I, I, and is the dean of the program that uh, we are uh, currently contemplating. So there are, there are two backdrops to this session today. One is, of course, um, you know uh, what's happening in the entire global economy and and the future of digital money, which is the topic. But at the same time, uh, we also have the opportunity to talk about uh, IIM Calcutta and Talent King's new initiative. On this program on on global uh, economy and and digital money and of course all of you who are attending uh, need no introduction to the fact that this is an extremely interesting and turbulent time in the global economy for a variety of reasons uh, the pandemic um, u.s elections um, the original contraction in various economies and all of that there's a lot of fallout factors currently at play and they may have one can probably argue this on the most uncertain times where looking into the future is not a fork in the road there are many forks in the road that uh, one has to possibly uh, grapple with. So the way we will run the session today is uh, we'll have about 40 minutes of uh, initial moderated questions where I'll be directing certain questions to Tithankar and uh, to Professor Ray um, to talk about, you know, uh, Tithankar of course needs no introduction because as a chief economist of the National Stock Exchange, he has, you know, the inside view of where the economy is going at least through the lens of the uh, stock market at the very least and of course broader uh, as well, and uh, Professor Ray also will talk about uh, some of the things that we're trying to do uh, together uh, to create this learning opportunity for uh, professionals, uh, aspiring CFOs, aspiring investment leaders, aspiring chief economists of various institutions, uh, to see how uh, they can really, you know, understand the world that we live in today and how the world is going to unfold. Because between technology and disruption, I think we are sitting in the middle of a very, very dramatic change. So with that being the background, let me start off with my first question to uh, Dithankar. Um, Dithankar, I think uh, we got a bit of a shocker recently with the Indian economy uh, suddenly contracting at a rate that was not expected. And uh, one still argues whether that's just a blip or it's an annualized phenomenon. We don't know where that's going. You've seen a bit of China still kind of uh, showing some positive growth. We've seen US having a decline, but nowhere near as much as India. So just want your views on where do you think the world is headed in terms of the big macroeconomic landscape uh, in the coming uh, year or two? So, uh, Shatno, thanks a lot. Uh, always a pleasure. So, you know, in terms of a perspective, this is probably the, the very worst you know, GDP growth that the world would see since World War II. There is a, a, you know, a chart from World Bank which essentially shows that the global economy fell about 15% in uh, in around World War II. But since then, we've never had uh, such a scenario. And you've got to uh, compare it with the, with the last big crisis that we had, the global financial crisis. And even then, the numbers were not below zero. This time, uh, IMF's expectations are that uh, global growth would be around minus 5%. That's the highest in the last 70 odd years. And uh, if you take away the, uh, you know, the, the two wars, then uh, this is one of the worst that uh, you know is that we have seen in the last 150 years. So uh, the, the the magnitude of the problem has to be understood in that sense. And and uh, beyond magnitude, one we should also look at the distribution of the of how big a crisis is Corona crisis. You know, even in even during the World War II, when global economy fell 15 percent, and uh, you know, pardon me, I'm giving such a big perspective, but even then. Only about 50, 60 percent of all the countries in the world were involved. Right now, the coronavirus has affected about 93 percent of all global economies. So, uh, about you know, uh, seven percent of uh, economies you know are are going to show some kind of positive growth or, or or are not going to be affected, and most of them are fairly fairly small. So, it's 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 a very pervasive negative phenomenon, and uh, you know the the the, the result is that uh, the kind of solutions that central banks have proposed now are again unprecedented. So you've seen central bank balance sheets explode uh, in a sense that we've, you know, that makes the global financial crisis look 
pretty small and most of us would have thought one would not see your prices beyond the global financial crisis in our lifetimes in our careers at least so uh, it is it is quite serious to answer your first question and and, and again uh, what are the implications for india you know india will see negative growth for the first time since 1980 i keep telling uh, whenever i you know do these webinars the audience most of them were not born around that time so uh, you know so we've never seen a kind of uh, you know negative growth that we would see this time and and what's worse is that while you know economists uh, like us are expecting numbers from minus 6 to minus 10 some people say minus 12 minus 13 we are still in a state of uncertainty we don't really know how bad the situation is and uh, you know believe me uh, mainstays of this economy consumption investment both have taken a serious hit so uh, not to be too negative at the start of the seminar but i just wanted to lay down that this is probably the worst probably the worst that we would see in uh, you know in a, in a very very long time i mean in absolutely a long time and and uh, you know in terms of you know your other part of the question about us and and uh, and china you see uh, us job uh, you know unemployment rates went up all the way till 1930s levels the depression of 1930s so uh, the the jobless claims went to like 10% of the population you know uh, so the the numbers are are now sort of coming back to some level of some semblance of normalcy because of the lockdown uh, lift off but other than that these are uh, you know fairly bad and uh, you're right about uh, you know china already is showing some signs of improvement if i take uh, pmis uh, purchasing manager indexes as a as an index of uh, what managers have uh, you know in, in the sense of uh, the next 3 months or so china is already above 50 which essentially says that the outlook over the next quarter is better than it was the last 3 months so uh, in a nutshell uh, probably the worst we have seen for india definitely the worst in the last 40 years and and i don't think we have we've seen the bottom yet and uh, certainly very bad for the us and probably not so bad for china Well, thank you for such a good uh, round up i think that's very really comprehensive uh, tankar so professor ray uh, taking a different dimension on this i mean you know um, the politics and the economy are always interconnected right politics and economics so if you look at it i mean when such upheavals happen in the economic landscape uh, political systems start to shake as well because nobody is really uh, you know signed up for so much pain at the same time literally around the world so if you look at um, what's happened with the gst uh, another shocker uh, in recent times that you know uh, sort of a so called sacred contract if you may call that between the center and the states in india you know re- literally there is a situation here where that pact or that compact is broken and gst is one of the crowning achievements uh, so to speak of recent uh, indian uh, political uh, you know sort of governments so do you think this is a very serious issue or do you think this is a very minor issue at this point in time i mean if, if tax collections dry up so dramatically if the you know redistribution of taxes becomes a major political tug of war between centers and states uh, and and, and as i see this in, in in broader terms because in the us the center and the federal the state the, the states and the center don't seem to be wo- working lock in step one reason why us despite its great medical system is supposed to be uh, supposed to be the best in managing disease is one of the worst affected by covid is because the complete coordination between the central and state has fallen apart on public health right so i'm just trying to understand is this another pattern that uh, along with this pain of the economic uh, crisis that uh, ithankar articulated are we also looking at major political upheavals well put shantanu i have been happier if you would have asked this question tomorrow because tomorrow is the meeting happening so i would have perhaps had more clarity about shape of things to come but so be it as you know you know uh, economics when they forecast something they assume everything excepting responsibility so in that spirit let me let me <laughs> speculate on shape of things to come this in some sense is a collateral damage of the abysmal economic situation that just now dr patnaik has very articulately you know described so there was a political contract a social contract that after the gst law has come into being implementation from july 1st 2017 the shortfall is calculated assuming 14% annual growth of gst 
No, this 14% annual growth of GST, this assumption is going anywhere and you know, at this juncture. So the shortfall is really that of the protected level is something like three lakh crores. So when you have this shortfall, what Senta can do, Senta can simply, you know, in some way borrow from the market and compensate it the states. That would have been the ideal situation as far as the states are concerned. However, Center has their own concern. You know, our budgetary numbers, they have been rather careful, but at least the parallel commentators say there are elements of underestimation in the fiscal numbers. So therefore, if all the things there, central government, I'm sure, legitimately are concerned with the potential backlash from the rating agencies. And therefore, even in the stimulus, the pure fiscal stimulus has been rather under check. It, it didn't you know, exceed beyond a point. So what are the options? The option was something like there was envisaging that RBI will create a special window, something like 97,000 crore, or the rest, 2.35 trillion, they can borrow from the market. In both the options, the levy of GST compensation would be extended beyond the transition period of five years. But at this juncture, the issue has become really political. To that extent, I have seen at least the finance minister of a particular southern state say using very strong words, including newspaper journalists have started speculating whether the states can take the center to the poor. These are unheard of things. But essentially, in fact, there are there are the attorney general sort of in a recent opinion has given that the center has no statutory obligation. I'm not a lawyer, I don't understand these finer points, but at least earlier in August, the finance secretary informed the parliamentary standing committee that the government was in no position to pay for it. And I believe today, the finance minister has issued a statement that yes, they are going to do something, but that doesn't necessarily mean they will borrow and just give the money to the state. So way ahead, it's like typical bargaining solution. You can have a cooperative outcome in the presence of a genuine political arbitration. And I hope that's going to emerge tomorrow. But it could be a non-cooperative outcome. In that case, Shantanu, the question you had that is it we are we going to see the breakdown of certain things? Uh, they if they sit on the table and negotiate, but unable to come to a mutually consistent goal. But I think. Indians, we as Indians have a remarkable capability of solving it in the final moment. So I, I would be hopeful that tomorrow we'll see some light at the end of a long tunnel. Great. So that's uh, on a bit of a hopeful note there. That's good to know. Uh, yeah, I mean, these kinds of situations are not going to get solved without some compromise on all sides. Yes. Um, so, so that being the case, uh, let me let me now, we talked about macro, we talked about political landscape. Let's come back to um, you know Tithankar's uh, what I consider his bread and butter, which is stock markets. The global stock markets, you know, over time have kind of in some sense decoupled from what's happening in the economy because you know there are multiple reasons: supply side money chasing companies, perhaps not enough to chase, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and and then perhaps uh, very aggressive factoring uh, of uh, you know future scenarios. So, with all that being the case, I mean, are we going to see the stock market kind of behave in ways that are completely decoupled from what's happening in the macroeconomy or I mean are we going to see irrational exuberance to quote the famous Alan Greenspan are we going to see on the other hand some realism are we going to see some real pessimistic stuff just you know from your vantage point which I guess nobody has a better vantage point than you both in the Indian stock market and global stock markets are they going to behave in certain ways that are predictable or you think the whole thing is completely up in the air so they say right uh, 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 markets can remain irrational longer than we can remain solvent so uh, what what is happening is <laughs> if you if you compare you know um, uh, we we had a we had a crisis in 2008 our markets are 15 percent us markets fell 20 percent it was uh, you know it was a crisis that brought uh, so many companies to their knees and uh, what was the solution central banks essentially went for you know they they they, they sort of differentiated between solvency and liquidity they they sort of ensured going forward a liquidity problem should not translate into a solvency problem 
so this started you know the you know the plethora of measures that were taken in terms of quantitative you know easing one easing two we went to qe4 then we went to operation twist so uh, the the overriding solution over the last you know uh, decade uh, and slightly more than a decade has been that we should provide enormous amounts of liquidity and this liquidity at some point does go to asset classes we've seen that i mean uh, if you see global markets and our markets are no exception really but if you see developed markets you are seeing the consequences of this enormous amount of liquidity central bank balance sheets expand and then uh, you no know, regardless of the multiplier you know at some point you do have m3s across the world expanding and uh, you know this time there is there is there is no different so if you see a jump uh, you know if you see the central bank balance sheets now versus how they were in january 2020 you will see uh, be it the fed be it you know ecb be it boj be it our own rbi you've seen a significant expansion in balance sheets and that is leading to this you know supply side liquidity that you very likely mentioned shantanu so markets you know what can markets do markets keep rising and uh, you know you the the next question comes obviously about can these markets then you know which are which because they by by this act of movement uh, upward movement they decouple from the macro how long can this last so the typical you know historical answer has always been around earnings if markets can justify earnings or future earnings you know you get discount only so much into the future so markets right now are already factoring in fy22 sort of earnings fy21 is is already written off so fy22 earnings in some stocks fy23 is also started getting factored in uh, so if earnings you know even future earnings can justify these valuations markets sustain otherwise usually what happens is you you see a, a phenomenon where markets move up markets get increasingly uh, you know concentrated and after concentration if that concentration is not sort of uh, sustainable with future earnings or prospect of better earnings markets come off this is essentially you know the the question therefore is uh, can the the surfeit of liquidity that we've had now and which is if you see all kinds of central bank commentary including the last major one from uh, you know fed's powell one can only distinguish between a soft landing and a hard landing depending on how uh, you know uh, earnings actually come up if earnings uh, to, to answer your question um, the excess liquidity that we've seen over the last several years has led to markets moving up and this is not just uh, equity markets bond yields used to be around 3% 3.5% around the global financial crisis these days the us 10 year is at 1% or lower so the the yields have gone down significantly fully 25% of the global you know uh, aum debt aum is uh, at uh, negative rates so uh, yields have you know hit rock bottom and unlikely to rise anytime soon and uh, in terms of equity or any risk asset if future earnings do not come up then you can only look at a soft landing or a hard landing okay so that's that's a very nice uh, i would say describe it um, so So back to you, Professor Ray. Um, uh, this is a moment maybe we can talk about the program that uh, you know on, on global economy and digital money that uh, we are you know jointly offering um, to the to, to professionals. Uh, could you tell us? I mean, in, in, you know, when we discussed this program and we decided to launch it from I am Calcutta and Talent Sprint on global economy and digital money, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion about content and 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 why this program is unique. So maybe you can take a few minutes to describe what this program will entail and what it will communicate. and perhaps also maybe you can talk about how the current developments we just talked about last few minutes uh, how some of these issues will be tackled in this context you know shantanu you recall when we talked about we were talking about this for nearly 8 months so when we were talking 8 to 8 months to a year when we were talking about this the crisis was yet to start so we started it in peace time but we our conviction became more that is going to be relevant for the war time as well in some sense all of us were guided by some philosophy that the global economy has a phoenix like tendency it can it can get reborn and one of the triggers for this rebirth could come from the broader digital question and it's from there that we thought 
you know, this program, particular program that I am C and Talib Spring thought are going to offer called Advanced Program in Global Economy and Digital Money, we had very broadly two broad modules. One is on the global economy and other is digital money, and we wanted to, you know, intermingle them. In terms of pure global economy, we thought the way we, we, we sort of conceived the program, this has a mixture of the sublime and the mundane. We start typically, we tend to start typically from basics. So we, we there are a large variety of people who can join them. For example, the very first module, the digital economic decision making and market structure, we start from fundamentals of demand and supply. But then we, we move up and bring their introduction to game theory, discuss Nash bargaining, then come to market failure, externalities, asymmetric information, we bring Akalev's notion of market for layman's, and then we bring microeconomics for digital economy because that's something that is not taught in the in the curriculum in the universities. We talk, discuss digital platforms, market player, and what's the implication for market strategy. So we bring from the very mundane of the microeconomic basics and then bring it to the microeconomics for digital economy. Then we bring the macro in. In, in the sense of at this juncture is very relevant to spend or not to spend. That's a typical Hamletian dilemma that how much to spend and not to spend that government all over the world are facing at this juncture. I mean, even the GST issue that we have, we have highlighted just now, is comes from that dilemma also. But then we bring money there and we felt end of the day money is an act of faith, like God. Now, is, since it's an act of faith, we need to, it's a construct. It's a construct of the civilization. And it's there that what would be the nature of money in a post pandemic world? Then we look at the global economic trend in the 21st century. And we look at the trends of globalization and deglobalization. For example, we need to understand <laughs> the competing strategies of America first, China plus one, or Atman Irvar Bharat, whether these are. These are away from globalization. That story may be very much well needed within globalization. From there, we come to international trade and payments and look at the foreign portfolio investment, foreign direct investment, and basically the sovereign debt and capital flows in the post COVID world. This is the global economy broad module, whereas a parallel module will be, in fact, in fact they'll, they'll, be, they'll be intertwined while actually the program will be happening, they'll be intertwined. We start with a discussion of the crypto economics, with the history of ledger technology, the emergence of blockchain, what would be the convergence of economics and cryptography in blockchain, because cryptography is there for since long. It's only now the economics have started taking interest. Otherwise, you know, if you recall, when John Nash was solving those kind of problems in the in, in the context of World War II, he was solving a problem with cryptography as well. Let me bring FinTech there. Then from there, we bring digital money in modern global economy. We'll discuss the platform economics and various typology. We'll look at money as cash in blockchains as a special chain and as a utility. Then we go to you know pure future as a polycentric economic order. Because right now, the money that we see, we essentially see as a centralized registry. What would happen if there is a decentralized registry? Then we end this whole conversation with the discussion of a mixture of centralized registry with decentralized one, namely central bank digital currency. And we look at blockchain model for implementing central bank digital currency, CBDC. We look at the historical relevance. We look at the typology. We look at the BIS is tending to do a survey for last last seven years, how those surveys are, are showing. And then finally, we look at the recent Chinese experience, what had been and what could have been the Indian RBI stance. So that's in a broad, in natural, the six modules, and it will end with a capstone project. So I thought we bring a wholesome plate that is really interesting and 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 arising for all all of us. 
Thank you, Professor Ray. I mean, as you were describing this, I was thinking that it's almost like a past, present, and future kind of an evolution of you know going from uh, classical macroeconomics all the way to a digital money future. So that curve is very visible. I'll come back to this whole thing about CBDC in China in a second to you eventually. Uh, but meanwhile, I wanted to get back to the Thankar and ask the question about digitalization of the economy. Uh, I think in very in passing, uh, Professor Ray talked about globalization trends versus deglobalization trends, the tendency to put up tariff barriers versus you know try to globalize. So we've seen all those come and go. And at this point in time, the world is largely clearly directing and uh, directing itself towards a more inward looking insular a uh, nationalistic view that's almost everywhere. You know, Atmanirbhar, America first, are all examples of the same phenomenon that people want to deglobalize and look inwards. But anyway, while deglobalization may be happening, uh, the bigger question is that technology reach and digital economy is clearly accelerating. Of that, there is no doubt. So I just want to get your sense as an economist, uh, what are some of the examples of digital economy that you are excited about in the future that you think the world will be operating differently. The economies will operate differently because of technology going forward. See, um, uh, you know, first of all, my compliments. The the outline of the program is is amazing. I mean, the 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 reach uh, starting from supply demand forces all the way till blockchain and uh, you know to CBDCs. It's it's just amazing. I'm sure uh, you know it would be very very fruitful and it will uh, you know it will be a significant increase in, in in the knowledge set of anybody who takes such a course you know my comments on the on the outline first of all you know uh, uh, the the uh, the extent of digitalization was taking place with you know before our eyes but we weren't really we weren't really recognizing it covid has accelerated that in a big way so uh, you know most of us all of us carry you know mobile phones with us which have significant amount, which are essentially computers now. Actually, so the amount of transactions. Uh, let me just put in one quick example. The largest share of trading today at our exchanges, NSEs, is through internet-based trading. People uh, trade higher. Uh, you know, retail traders trade more than institutional traders. Retail traders uh, have taken to trading in a big way. So uh, there's a this is a significant change from the from the days when I'm not talking about uh, you know uh, non-electronic trading, but even in electronic trading, uh, you know most people you know the actual trading activity used to be through institutional investors. Now with phones, with smartphones, and this is digitalization, if nothing else, um, the extent of trading has gone back to the retail world. So uh, you know the the extent of uh, how much brokers are, you know, just pure electronic financial intermediaries has to be seen to be believed. This is one side. You know, the the other example, of course, is as I see in the in the outline, digital currencies. It's a, uh, you know, we we had an experiment in going electronic on currencies or or you know going cashless in 2016 didn't work very well. But if you notice now the extent of uh, you know transactions that happen through electronics uh, you know cashless transactions it has it has significantly picked up i would not be you know uh, surprised when you know when i see numbers for a company like amazon where uh, you know the whole world saw a significant drop in revenues but e-commerce companies saw quantum jumps so uh, you know people are taking to digitalization in a in a in a, in a very very significant way Let's consider our own webinar. So while uh, Shantanu, you're right, I mean, people are turning more and more insular. People are looking towards having supply chains, you know, concentrated supply chains. The extent of these webinars, the extent of interaction uh, between people globally during this uh, COVID period has, has seen a quantum jump. So while, you know, as, as uh, Thomas Friedman says, on, on one side, we are seeing, you know, a, a move towards being more insular, inward-looking protectionism. On the other side, the world is getting globalized ever more. So, uh, you know, these are, you know, one could keep going. I mean, even production, I will not be surprised where you know, uh, the day when 3D printers become a little more, uh, you know, affordable. Uh, why, why should you have a significant amount of merchandise trade when you can actually transfer, uh, you know, securely that digital knowledge Knowledge and then have production in your own shores through a 3D printer. So this 
might seem like a leap of faith at this point but uh, remember uh, you know this can happen sooner than we believe it is so uh, digitalization today uh, starting from trading to production to commerce uh, education there are several areas where you know uh, we have embraced digitalization in a, in a way uh, one would you know seem unthinkable even even 5 years back so you know uh, this itself can be the discussion of an entirely you know a panel discussion i would say but uh, i i will stop here at some point no thank you that's a wonderful set of great examples i, I hope the audience was paying attention because a lot of great references and passing to many nuances there so let me just add my nuance to this you know i, I do a lot of work uh, with the talent obviously and and i spent a large part of my life in the us and then moved back to india so you know there was a time when h1 visas were you know a dime a dozen and it was like you could you could they were showering from the skies and then there was a time uh, that you know in the last few years we've seen that dry up and if you look at the entire trumpian philosophy of america first putting up a physical wall with mexico and topping h1 b immigration etc but if you look at post covid with wfh i think the whole idea of a immigration visa has no meaning literally because if i'm an american enterprise today i can directly employ people anywhere in the world because work from home is the norm right so so in many ways the labor the economics the idea that you know labor has to move for it to be tapped correctly etc is also gone i mean i, I think it's just a matter of time i don't know tax regimes will be interesting but having said that uh, if i leave that aside for a minute in reality we will clearly see a situation where you will have that talent movement becomes a non issue because it's by definition global Right. Yeah. So um, I will move to uh, Professor Ray back now and uh, bring back the old question about the Chinese uh, CBDC experiment. As a former CBDC, uh, to back to yourself, I'd like your thoughts on uh, the Chinese experiment, how serious it is, and uh, would like your views on. You know, how do you think a country like India with RBI or even the Feds? Uh, how would they look at this problem? Do you think digital central bank digital currency is just a matter of time, or do you think there are still ifs and buts? Interesting question. To me, the central bank digital currencies spring from a philosophy that when you can't bid them, join them. It's essentially because central banks, by nature, are conservative institutions. So, and I'm sure they didn't want to lose the monopoly of issuing fiat currency. I mean, this is this is the reason we all remember central bank that you pick up a piece of paper and the RBI governor signs as I promise to pay the bearer the sum of rupees so and so. What what does he offer? So suppose I meet tomorrow RBI governor in a shopping mall and show him a note that hey you promised me to pay the sum. What he is going to give you? He is going to give you another currency note. So essentially, therefore, please do remember, as I said earlier, this is an act of faith. The act of faith is essentially was monolithic. And by monolithic, we say that central banks all over the world have this power of issuing fiat currency. But the money does not only mean fiat currency. Money, if you recall, we all mean the fiat currency plus checkable deposits. So, you know, in the other half of money, namely the checkable deposits, has already become digital. I don't know, excepting, you know, one of those IPL matches where the winners are give, give, getting a big six feet by six feet checkbooks. These days, we hardly have issued checks. Checks have been replaced by a digital transfer. So, on the other half, because if you take M3 to be 100, the, the essentially the, the share of deposit will be how much share of deposit will be much more something like something like you know uh, 87 percent and it's like 13 percent will be the currency so, so we are pleased to remember we are talking of that 13 percent the other 87 percent has already become digital this is this is nothing to be uh, nothing to be you know we, we don't normally tend to think so within this what happens if the central bank digital currency now people realize this potential is essentially therefore central bank digital currency is taking the advantage of digitization but making it part of a centralized registry so it is it is stripping off the cryptocurrency from the so called anonymity and so called instability problem and bringing it here 
And if you recall, you know, if you we all, all remember, can it become the default currency? Now, why I do not know, but you realize that there are, it has huge potential, and that's how China and off late even US Fed have started taking it seriously. And if you recall that this whole thing for China came much earlier during the SARS epidemic. It is around that time that China really started thinking. And, but there are, of course, there could be opposition. One of the oppositions, and I think, comes from this whole industry of the anti-money laundering terrorist financing that you want to you know, put it under the carpet. I was surprised to see, you know, I was looking at the numbers, the five largest holders of US dollar denominated debt. Of course, the first three, no point for guessing, this is China, Japan, and UK. But the next two are Luxembourg and Cayman Islands. So therefore, please do realize that when digitization comes in, that is also will be a great help against this AML, CFT, anti-money laundering. And, and therefore, I would expect things like FATF, the whole anti, the, the, the global regulatory structure against money laundering are going to help this as well. So I'm optimistic. I do not know. I do have a timeline up to uh, by when it is going to get. I don't have a timeline, but I'm, I'm rather optimistic that you know, post-pandemic world is, at least we'll see, a significant and substantial footprint of the central bank digital currency. Okay, that's that's a very important uh, and interesting prediction. I think COVID seems to have accelerated a lot of things that you know we took decades to debate on whether to do it or not to do it. But in many ways, COVID is just making those decisions of fait accompli, which is you have to do it because there's no other choice. You know, so so that's that's a very interesting uh, point as well. Uh, I have one uh, rejoinder question just to back to maybe I can ask this to the Thunder also. That you know, the, the digital money, digital currency, especially CBDC, once it's in place, uh, don't you think this will also invite, uh, in some sense, uh, Big Brother? I mean, won't the state become just too powerful? Because with cash, we still have some anonymity left, right? I mean, I was thinking, I was driving through a toll booth in a highway, and I was thinking that you know, if I pay by cash versus pay by Easy Pass, there's a big difference because the data footprint is created. My movements are now trackable, traceable. People know which toll booth I've gone through at which day, etc. So how do we balance all this? I mean, technology in one level seems to be improving information gathering, analysis, insight. But I think this is also the beginning of the end of all kinds of privacy, which is also ironical because we're also trying to pass new laws on privacy as we speak. Maybe, Kithankar, I'd like you to take a crack at this. Any thoughts? Yeah. You know, you raise a very important point, Shantanu. There is a very clear trade-off. As an economist, uh, as economists, we should realize that there's a very clear trade-off between the advantages of having a digital currency and uh, you know loss of loss of privacy. So uh, we uh, sort of take the state to be paternalistic. We believe that a state is is a, is a benevolent state, um, as as uh, Partho pointed out here. It will uh, you know having a digital currency would definitely go a long way in uh, in bringing down anti-money laundering, uh, bringing down money laundering. Uh, it will really, you know, when you have a, when you have a track of where flows are happening, where currency is happening, uh, currency flows are happening, you, you really can arrest, you know, uh, corruption in a big way. You can arrest money laundering in a, in a significant way. What is uh, also to be noted, however, is you lose privacy. So uh, if the state no longer is paternalistic, if the state is no longer benevolent, the the increased power in the hands of the state could be a source of significant misuse here. So uh, these are uh, these are points one has to really you know keep in mind. Therefore, any kind of uh, you know implementation of such technology or such a regime must be with its own significant checks and balances, such that you know uh, no misuse happens uh, of, of 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 so much power. You know, uh, I can I can just go back 70 years and think of how our you know fathers uh, you know when 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 they when they looked at the constitution they they broke up our state into three parts right legislature judiciary executive with a clear uh, drop 
you know clear wall between these two how each other would control you know uh, would control the uh, you know abuse of power and here one has to actually go back to the drawing board and take a whole look as to how technology could be could be misused uh, i can give a very quick example uh, when uh, in the us when obama was uh, was the was the president there was this entire uh, debate about how the nsa there was looking at only metadata of all phone calls but they were looking at all phone calls so uh, there was a huge discussion about you know while the objective was that they were trying to understand uh, you know uh, if there were potential terror activities through conversations and they were never really hearing the conversations but you know we looking at metadata but it was bad enough in terms of uh, privacy uh, you know uh, from a privacy seen from a privacy angle there are several such uh, you know uh, several such areas where the advent of technology and digital currency is only one could lead to privacy issues one other example i can think of is uh, imagine you had all digital cars and or imagine you had all cars which were linked with gps and you know uh, uh, rather than you know people driving if, if you had a way where uh, cars would automatically move where the traffic is uh, is lower today you make that decision based on you know google maps but what if this was automated the advantage is you will never have traffic jams the disadvantage is your movements are always tracked at a particular uh, by by uh, by an entity so uh, you know as economists there has to be a, a clear understanding of the trade off one sees uh, between between a paternalistic or a notion of a paternalistic state and uh, and abuse of abuse of state power so uh, this becomes a even more issue when uh, fiat currency is involved uh, you know when when it's money it's it's, it's absolutely more important absolutely fabulous Fab fabulous example uh, i will start to wrap up here uh, and, and hopefully get some audience questions quickly but uh, my last question to you uh, uh, one, uh, to, i want to comment on something on our data card. please go ahead yeah yes, yes. Please. That's, that's very very important that's very very important question this is like keynes reminded us that the any modern man has to any modern economy whether it's macro level or man as a, as a micro level have to solve three problems and that's like efficiency equity and individual liberty now how and all you do it that depends on society to society but that's a very very valid question but only thing is we have been warned on all kinds of science fiction by isaac asimov that didn't that didn't fructify end of the day we all have heard the Russian hand in U.S. election. Who could have thought this? That this uh, people are seriously discussing Russian hand in U.S. election. So therefore, it is somewhere we do have to draw the line. How much efficient you want to have, and how much personal liberties we have to keep. And as Lord Acton, you know, reminded us long back, eternal vigilance is price of liberty. So as conscious Homo economicus, we have to be eternally vigilant. Very nice, Homo economicus. I will remember that one. So, um, uh, so my last question uh, to you, Tithankar, um, the new age professional. I mean, right. So, from a perspective of the kind of people that you work with, you recruit, you like to have on your teams, or you know, the emerging finance professional, investment professional, treasury professional. Uh, what is your recommendation of what important skills and expertise you would recommend a modern professional? So um, the the world of finance has become very diverse. So you would you would realize, I mean, and and it it now uh, it it now encompasses encompasses technology in one time at one point, mathematics at another, computer sciences and uh, you know in one more. So um, I over the last you know uh, of the you know last at least fifteen years I've been recruiting or or having people. I uh, would like ideal the ideal candidate to understand three languages. Uh, one is the language of English. They should be able to express themselves meaningfully. This is beyond above and beyond their tool set. They should be able to express themselves clearly. They should be able to express themselves in the language of mathematics clearly. And thirdly, they should be able to express themselves in the language of computer science. So uh, these three things are uh, what I have seen as an analyst uh, you know, indispensable 
uh, skill sets beyond you know uh, what they already know so an mba grad or 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 a, or a, or a masters student they they have a significant amount of knowledge drilled into them uh, obviously one would want them to be worldly wise one would want them to understand what's happening in the world read up but these three things they should be able to you know write properly they should be able to uh, you know express and understand things in in mathematics properly and of course uh, have a have a you know a, a computer science knowledge set to them these things are these three things are absolutely important and uh, over the last you know uh, two decades uh, things have moved from uh, from c fortran in terms of languages to you know now you have uh, r you have python you have machine learning machine learning you have artificial intelligence so um, uh, these are all you know, while the while the tools while the while the uh, you know paradigm uh, you know while the while the tooling the paradigm does sort of remain the same that you have to be able to express yourself you have to be able to use numbers to make your point and then you have to be able to bridge the gap between the experts and the and the generalists you know there are there is a we in india see a major problem where people are very worldly wise in terms of markets but they are absolutely unaware of what's happening in the academia and the academia usually uh, there are there is a very small set who does take an interest in the goings on in the market but usually you know these are these are separate so acting as that bridge you know being a being is being aware of what's happening around your world and also academics are not uh, sitting in their ivory towers and wasting time they knowledge is moving very fast as we speak so being that having that bridge is is you know is is most important in my understanding I would like uh, Professor Ray to comment on this comment because I just loved it so much. I was reminded of this book I read recently called Range, which the basic premise of the book is that in a world of uh, too many specialists, the guys who will win are the generalists who can stitch together all the specialization. <laughs> so, um, so Professor Ray, your thoughts on Tithankar's comments about the the kind of skills talent should have? One of the one of the less charitable interpretation of academics, and 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 there's a large truth in it is to think an academician in silos it's like yeah. tunnel vision look at this don't look at anything else and it reminded me of a professor i'm not naming him he's an extremely well-known mathematical economist so people after summer vacation were going home and he called some of them and said look when you go home your mom and dad might ask you how inflation is occurring why gdp is rising tell them i do not do that economics and show my class notes of dynamic programming problem and tell them that I do this economics. So this is a false dichotomy. And the earlier we forget this false dichotomy, the better. This, therefore, what in fact, what we try to do in this program, even we try to do a blend of so-called sublime and mundane, so-called theory and practice, and therefore the economy and digital economy as well. Often these two guys are separate, and economist thinks that he understands all the broad picture. And these are these kind of digitization are the matter of carpentry. Forgetting completely that Keynes compared economists with the carpenters and later on with the dentist. That you know that's a function of an economist. And I would even take liberty to add the Tonko's uh, metaphor, saying that even for analysts, they are also like dentists or carpenters. So that autonomous. So mm -hmm. essentially, therefore, forget this false dichotomy. Learn the theory and the practice. Otherwise, we are going to be dinosaur, irrespective of our age in our workplace. When I can tell of myself, I I joined IM 10 years back, and one of the guys came to do a PhD with me. He was an he was an MSTAT from ISI Calcutta. He wanted to do a PhD on algo trading. And I've heard of algorithm and I've heard of trading, but he he was an awful terrible mathematician who wanted to do it. So I realized we needed to bridge those gaps. And the faster, the seamlessly we do, the better. So from that standpoint, I entirely agree with Shantanu. Yes, have generalists, but have certain degree of depth in this. Don't be a superficial. 
Wonderful. Great. Uh, I think we're out of time from my side quite a bit ago, but uh, for the challenge of technology, I want to see if the questions from the audience are available. Um, is anybody there on the audio uh, from the organizers to pull in some questions? Yes, Paul. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Vartika. And, you know, it has been a really engaging discussion amongst Dr. Patnayak, Dr. Ray, and Dr. Paul. Uh, you know, uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in for today's uh, webinar, which is uh, on Navigate the Digital Economy, a goldmine of opportunities, which is done in association with IM's, IAM Calcutta and Talent Sprint. So, uh, you know, in order to make this discussion more interactive, uh, I would like to put forward audience question to the panel. And uh, the participants are requested to keep sending questions on the private chat window to us. So, you know, starting with the first question, uh, you know and uh, this is that there is a lot of uh, volatility in the stock market due to global pressure so are we still going to see a correction deeper than what we saw on march 24th mr patnaik do you want to take it this must be a professional hazard for you <laughs> One of the things, actually, one of the things that one cannot do uh, while being in the exchange is talk about the direct of markets. So even if I put on an academic hat and you know uh, talk about efficiency market hypothesis and say that market direction is not predictable, uh, I don't even have to do that from an exchange perspective. I cannot give any direction on on uh, you know any anything on market direction. I can only I can only say that uh, you know if you look at historically historical volatilities. I actually did have a chart here, uh, which essentially shows uh, one of the points that I made earlier, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the panel discussion was that uh, you had a significant amount of volatility, a significant amount of liquidity in the last uh, 12 years. One consequence of that, apart from, uh, you know, rising risk assets has been that volatility has actually been, uh, has been brought down. So uh, to the questioner, uh, one has to, he has to just go back and see either, you know, our VIX or global VIX or any other major volatility indicator across debt assets, across equity assets, and you will realize that wall has actually come down. So, um, you know, so that answers part of the question. And the second part of the question is on, do we see a, a correction like March 24? The only way to answer that would be, are we expecting a shock equal to uh, March 2020? Are we expecting a shock uh, uh, where, you know, uh, one, the world was seeing the true extent of coronavirus for the first time. The world had no sense of how far things could go, go worse from here. The world was actually seeing global lockdowns for the first time, the very first time in history. You had, uh, you know, large parts of global economy shutting down, just shutting down. So that level of uncertainty was unprecedented so a similar uh, volatility can only come or similar correction should only be precedented by things that the market has not really factored in so at this point it will be difficult to surmise if there will be such shock uh, such a shock uh, you know at this point the the big unknowns for the markets are when do we have a vaccine when do we see uh, some side some sort of uh, you know uh, 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 you know, a recession in the numbers that we are seeing, you should you should see that while, uh, just as an example here for COVID, uh, globally, you know, we are getting about 250,000 COVID patients a day. But that number has stayed constant for the last three, four weeks. It's only India that has risen from about 60,000 patients a day to now 90,000 patients a day. So uh, you have to see that uh, for the world, COVID uncertainty is moving away from the disease to vaccine and then to the economic uncertainty whereas there are markets like india where the covid uncertainty continues to be there so there are many states where you know uh, numbers are still rising some states like maharashtra here i'm in mumbai numbers have started rising again so uh, for the markets it's basically unprecedented news that leads to volatility unprecedented news that leads to a shock and one has to keep that in mind the only other thing I'll add to this, Tithankar, if I may, is that apart from the question about the vaccine timing, the other big, uh, I think, factor this year, even though it's a binary factor, is the U.S. elections. That, that probably will have some implications. Yeah, because... Absolutely, definitely, absolutely. U.S. election is a, is a big imponderable, of course. Thank you. 
uh, sure. So, uh, you know, the next question that we have is that, you know, how will the US and EU and other leading powers respond to the e renminbi and will will there be a e rupee soon? To the Professor panel. Ray, you should take this one. As a former uh, central banker, this is for you. Yeah. This is these are these are one of those questions. You know, I I I, I I'm very fearful about this. Is like uh, Larry Summers said, the forecaster has a philosophy. So it's like one, two, three. What next? Three because yesterday is the best predictor of today. One, two, three. What next? Three not so fast. Two because everything has a mean reverting tendency. Or one, two, three. What next? One because what goes up must come down. So jokes apart, more seriously. What we expect that something is going to happen. In fact, if you see the ERMB got a slight dampener two weeks back. You know, the way it was moving, there was a dampening. So you can't get is something like you know going at, at certain horsepower in one direction. Right now, this is unknown, unknown. This is going to see some oscill oscillations, but all major central banks are watching and because this has also implication for the future of dollar, there's implication for the reserves currency, there's implication for how RMB can enter into that hegemony of global currency market. Therefore, everybody is watching and they are going to join. But how soon, how fast, that would be foolhardy for me to speculate. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Day. Uh, you know, the other question that we have is uh, how will the gig economy and digital commerce influence the economy? Over to the panel. This, I believe, Shantanu's question. Yeah, so I think the gig Absolutely, economy, I agree. Yeah, this is a gig economy is definitely, um, you know, uh, here to stay, even though COVID has given it a bit of a setback uh, for a variety of reasons, especially high touch kind of services um, have taken a hit like Uber and all of that, uh, Airbnb, et cetera. But clearly I think uh, we have crossed the Rubicon in terms of uh, saying that, uh, you know, going forward, you know, uh, the idea of automation uh, as a fundamental way of getting things done. Uh, and in some sense, automation um, becoming more of the way things get done and human resources uh, because the advent of technology like AI machine learning, a lot of the basic, you know, fundamental, I would say, frontline human functions may actually begin to get altered and automated. I think it's hard to see a world where people are paid more and more on a permanent basis, right, to do a steady job. So therefore, we are going to see the gig economy as a very uh, clear direction. I think it's already been happening for a while. The more advanced the economy is, the more gig-oriented it gets quickly. Um, and I think that is something we have uh, no question that that is a you know secular trend, maybe with a current temporary blip, but I don't see that reversing at all. If anything, the more automation we get, which COVID will accelerate, the more the gig economy will get steam as we go forward. On the flip side of it, um, you know, um, if you look at the digital commerce side of it, I mean, I think uh, the Thankar was pointing out earlier that if you look at the big winners of COVID, um, clearly big tech and uh, including in the big tech, Amazon. Uh, clearly, these companies have, you know, uh, picked up a huge, massive tailwind. And on the flip side, if you look at the bankruptcies in the U.S., uh, from major brands like Lord and Taylor to, you know, um, J.C. Penney. I mean, this is a Brooks Brothers. I mean, these are hundred-year-old brands that have retail outlets that are just going bankrupt literally in a matter of months, right? So clearly, uh, I would say that a digital commerce is going to replace it. If you look at where Walmart is doing acquisitions, like uh, you know, Flipkart is a little older one, but even today, clearly the big balance sheet, uh, traditional, conventional retailers are all coming after uh, e companies, right? So this is not to say that uh, digital commerce companies are all very profitable, etc. But you know, uh, in today's day and age, market acceptance by consumers is a much bigger predictor of somebody's valuation than any other thing. And in that sense, I think the COVID world and the subsequent world of more automation, more distancing, uh, a, a temporary lowering of trust will all lead to digital commerce getting more steam. So I, if I was betting, if I was a betting man, I would say gig economy and digital commerce, bring it on. I don't see any headwinds, I only see tailwinds. All right. Uh, so the next question that we have is that, you know, uh, 
with the rise of digital currency distributed ecosystems that are decentralized with their own regulators what challenges and opportunities do you see do you foresee for the central regulator to make itself genuine, genuinely relevant uh, not just imposing its power and might but to establish trust and ensure smooth functioning I'll, I'll, I'll take this uh, to me it appears in a very narrow sense a central bank digital currency is a currency note with a chip essentially therefore this is not the completely decentralized registry that you tend to get in case of a cryptocurrency here there is a centralized body the body has control but the money is no longer getting a physical form money is getting a virtual form so therefore the iron hand of the central bank remains but you get the advantage of at the same time a digital currency so how it is going to be where the people are going to trust the trust in money comes from bank trust in money comes from statehood end of the day you accept a green buck the way you accept it because you have certain faith on that particular state issuing the green buck so whereas when and if that faith goes away the value of the money goes away as well so i don't see a major challenge there but the challenge i see is more of one of practice in the sense people have to accept it it's like the initial days of credit card it's like the initial day, days of even uh, account transfer when imagine yourself for the first time you sat into a terminal and send some money digitally you are very shaky so how to get rid of that shakiness that there lies the problem in terms of faith i believe as long as the central banks exist as the as the issuer of fiat currency the form of currency whether it's digital or it is paper will not materially matter that much but please feel free to add with the or or shantan i think one point uh, also made in the in the uh, in the in the presentation in your way was that you look at our m3 most of it is anyway digital i mean yes. you see currency with the public demand deposits time deposits except cp everything else is digital anyway so uh, you know if it's just the is that the cash with the public that we are essentially talking about and uh, i i fully agree you know uh, uh, central banks will not leave the power the immense power that they have in terms of a fiat currency but you know, they are joining them if you can't uh, yes. beat them join them so i i, I wholeheartedly agree with, with that premise and one has to see in that framework you will if you know uh, you will see a much rosier future for cbdcs uh, you know versus uh, some some people sitting in their garages churning out uh, numbers for bitcoin uh, you know why will you know uh, central banks not go with the with the cbdc so so i would just add to this maybe be a little bit of a contrarian just to create uh, if you think about it what are states afraid of right i mean the central bank derives its power from state and the state is sovereign so i get that but if you look at states today i mean when there is a law and order problem and a crime to be solved today law and order people are turning to the police commissioner will try to call the head of google in india to try to track down where this particular search came from or they try to track down the head of facebook to figure out who actually posted this you know sexist harassment comment right just taking examples so in many ways i think and there was an article last week in the atlantic monthly i think which says that the most powerful man in the us is zuckerberg not uh, donald trump right Indeed. so in many ways i think the challenge to the state will come from the new form of state which is a virtual state which has 2 billion people 3 billion people 5 billion people in the case of facebook or in the case of uh, any of these and i always say that the next religious profit will come from twitter number of followers right it will not come from some other place so i think big tech is to is something to watch for i don't think it's going to happen in the near term but in the medium to long term a libra kind of situation uh, digital currency which has the backing of facebook and the facebook is a tribe of 3 to 5 billion people who put their lives and faith in facebook more than they put in the rbi i mean that's not a very unfair comparison i know don't don't kind of you know literally write it off is my point i have just one 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 thing to add to this 
who knows the biggest challenge could be amazon is going to hold the biggest indian bank instead of all the banks that you are currently talking of the amazon <laughs> could hold the biggest indian bank that's really a challenge yep very interesting thought mr ray and uh, you know uh, we are getting a lot of questions but uh, you know uh, in the interest of time i'll just ask this one last question from the participant side which is uh, that the uh, uh, this is regarding the iim calcutta economy program that how will this program be relevant for senior finance professionals this is like this a senior finance professional need to talk to the people they are engaged with otherwise believe me they will be reduced to dinosaurs in in the in in midst of the other rather intelligent people so it is like it is while there's a large chunk of pure functionality lies with the mid level executive but even for the senior professionals this gives the overview in which this kind of supervision can happen otherwise they will be hostage of these newer guys we don't want them to be hostage of these newer guys and therefore we want to equip them with this modern techniques i mean please tantanu if you want to add to this point is taken there's a there's a joke in uh, ceo circles that when you turn 50 you must appoint two executive assistants of age 25 each right <laughs> <laughs> so so that's basically you know how the world is and i think we all have to live by that uh, reality all right so interesting take on the subject and good insights shared by all the speakers however as this brings us towards the end of the webinar we would like short one minute or you know less than a minute concluding remarks from each speaker on you know the webinar today which is navigate the digital economy a gold mine of opportunities so let's start with mr patnayak i think uh, i would say i'll i'll keep it short i'll not i'll not even speak for a minute um, the world is changing the world was changing as uh, over the last 10 years or so and technology was the largest driver the top driver we weren't just we were passing through it and didn't recognize it with covid some of those changes have accelerated and if in your careers you're not tooling up to understand those changes if you are not tooling up to be a specialist then uh, the, the the bus will be missed and there won't be you know 2020 is possible you know you can get on that bus 2021 yes 2022 not really so i would say uh, you know uh, it is important to understand the digital world and how it's going to interact and change our lives now and therefore uh, you know uh, the course that we saw here is 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 one of those things that will get you on that bus and uh, you know i can't say it with any more force that that it has to be done and it has to be done today and it's important to understand how these things change i'll stop here well articulated sir uh, dr ray yes uh my two cents will be don't forecast in a crisis time because you will be suffering from pessimistic bias there are large trends and those large trends are going to be perhaps they might be tinkered off but as far as digital economy is concerned the future is bright thank you so it's so interesting from my Talk side about. i mean I, I will just quote the famous saying that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. I think in many ways we are going through uh, one of the biggest crises, and to me, crisis breeds opportunity, right? Crisis means chaos, but for the right set of eyes and the right pair of eyes, right pair, right brains, crisis is actually the hallmark of opportunity. So if you really want to be relevant in the new world, uh, embracing crisis and the change that comes from it is the smartest thing to do, right? and and in, and clearly if you look back in the last 10 20 years there is no other evidence of the fact that technology has come after retail it has disrupted retail it has come after hospitality it has disrupted hospitality it has come after banking it has disrupted banking now it's coming after uh, economics and finance there is inevitability to it right there is no way we can avoid um, embracing technology so in my view if you can't beat it join it All right. So, on behalf of the participants and the ETCFO team, I thank the speakers for sparing their precious time and addressing the queries in this webinar. Many thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you.
I also thank the webinar thank attendees. Thank you. I also thank the webinar attendees for their enthusiastic uh, participation. And if you have any queries unanswered, we will try our best to get them answered offline. So please stay connected and do subscribe and join ETCFO updates every day through our daily newsletters, especially designed for finance professionals. And always, always, always send us your thoughts, feedback, and requests. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you.